Okay, so this is a, a map of Saskatchewan. Searchlight's all about working in Saskatchewan. Why? Well, Saskatchewan is Canada's most favored mining jurisdiction. It's very mining friendly. It has uh, the richest deposits of uranium in the world. It has very valuable copper deposits and it's building a rare earth infrastructure. There are actually two rare earth refining facilities uh, being built in Saskatoon. So Searchlight has a portfolio of properties here and uh, I'll just show you where we are. So we're gonna to talk today a little bit about our Kulik Lake property, which is right here in the middle of uh, Northern Saskatchewan and just south of this area called the Athabasca Basin. And the second property is called Dudridge Lake. And that's right here, closer to La Ronge. So it's one of the most southerly uranium properties uh, in Northern Saskatchewan. And it has the advantage of being road accessible. So that means that exploration is very, very cost effective at Dudridge Lake compared to these other areas, which involve uh, flying men and materials into the property, which tends to drive up the cost significantly. As a company, you've committed to Saskatchewan in a, a fairly major way. Like, What was the thing that, that really drives you to be a Saskatchewan company? Um, Stephen Wallace is, is a, uh, a geologist with over 30 years experience. He drilled off part of one of the biggest gold discoveries in Canada, located in Ontario. It's called the Detour Lake Gold Mine. That's a multi-billion dollar asset and one of Canada's largest gold producers now. Stephen's told me that the, th the difference between Saskatchewan and Ontario is Saskatchewan has vastly less exploration done except for a couple of key areas and key commodities. So when uh, people consider Saskatchewan, they always think, oh, well, we've got to go to the Athabasca Basin and we've got to go drill for uranium. And many other valuable commodities in Saskatchewan have been totally ignored. Right. So this property that I'm talking about here, uh, Kulik Lake and Daly Lake, has never had a single drill hole on it. It's on the edge of the Athabasca Basin. It has over 50 uranium and rare earth showings, and not just small ones, very, very high-grade showings. And there are no drill holes anywhere on the property that we can find anywhere in the history of exploration. So that's why we're here. It's the, it's the prospectivity, and the fact is that we're pioneering the effort to find um, various strategic metals. Got it. Which is so, why you're also got a, a finger into the lithium game. Well, five fingers yes. more. Right. So let's talk about lithium. As you know, we're we're on the cusp of a green revolution as we pivot away from fossil fuels. And we need green energy generation and we need green transportation. And that involves lithium ion batteries and it involves uh, wind turbines and solar panels. And we need commodities for those things. Everybody thinks that a lithium ion battery is mainly lithium. Well, it's actually 5% lithium. There's a lot more to a lithium ion battery. Lithium, it's like a tennis match. Lithium is just the shuttlecock that goes back and forth over the net. The other rest of the game is graphite and nickel and manganese and, you know, and iron. Those are other critical elements. And that's only part of the uh, equation. If we're pivoting from fossil fuels, to electric vehicles, we have to replace two things. We have to replace the gas tank, then we have to replace the motor. So everybody knows a lithium ion battery is the new gas tank for an electric vehicle, but the motor is an electric motor instead of an internal combustion engine motor. And it has different elements in it. The most critical one are rare earths. And guess who controls all of the rare earths in the world? China. Yeah. We have no conventional rare earth production in North America right now. We have some concentrates that are being shipped over to China and being processed. So we know are, are strategically vulnerable to um, rare earth supply from China. And so we're doing our best to find a domestic source of rare earths. And we're starting with Kulik Lake. Why? Because it's the highest grade rare earth occurrence I've ever seen. The rare earths at Kulik Lake go up to almost pure rare earth minerals. We have trenches of almost virtually pure monazite. Monazite is the key rare earth mineral in the world. And we have trenches that, that have pure monazite outcropping at surface. <laughs> That's why we're here. But it's not just one showing. We have over 50 rare earth and uranium showings on our property. 
So, so once you get your hands on rare earths, the struggle has always been to process them, as you mentioned. The, yeah. That usually happens in China. Like, uh, how do you see that problem? The Saskatchewan government has has built a rare earths refinery and is commissioning it in 2024. So they're spending over $50 million, perhaps as much as $150 million on a rare earths refinery. And that's key. Why is it key? Because you don't want to be shipping rare earth long distances all over the world. You want to basically uh, get your source of rare earths as close to the refinery as you possibly can. Huh. And, and how far away is this happening from your uh, from your site? It's uh, down the road in Saskatoon. So we're uh, 30 kilometers from a, a road uh, that goes to the Key Lake Uranium Mine and Mill. So Kulik Lake here is about 50 kilometers south of Key Lake. Key Lake is operated by Cameco. It's a uranium mine where most of the uranium deposit has been mined off. And the mill and tailing spawned an entire processing infrastructure sits there uh, and they're trucking ore in from elsewhere in the Athabasca Basin. So there's there's a, a mill complex 30 to 50 kilometers north of our property. There's a road 30 to 50 kilometers west of our property. And if you if you truck ore from that road, you end up in Saskatoon. So it's a cat right away. Yes. Yeah. So it's about a hundred to 200 kilometers away, approximately. Uh, anyway. Um, Long cab ride. Um, <laughs> yes. So, so Alpha, like, this is, this is all a lot of stuff. Like there are a lot of different ways in which searchlight has uh, a, an ore in the lake of the green energy revolution, but you also have you have gold. You've got you've got uranium. You like, uh, do you worry that people see Searchlight as being a bit of a grab bag rather than looking deeper into the the technology or the the, the technicals of each of your properties? I think I don't think the market understands what rare earths are worth. As as you mentioned, we've had a bit of a boom in lithium. Lithium is worth twenty dollars a kilogram. Okay, and Uranium is worth $74 a pound. So if we convert that to kilograms, you're looking at, you know, uh, over $150 per kilogram. Dysprosium is worth $500 a kilogram. Neodymium and presidymium are worth $117 a kilogram. This is what we're exploring for. So if rare earths occur in exactly the same deposit types as lithium, wouldn't you rather look for something that's worth a hundred to a thousand dollars a kilogram versus something that's worth twenty? <laughs> that's my. That's what. That's why we're here. This stuff is more valuable, and it's like ice cream. The main rock type for hard rock lithium deposits is called pegmatite, and pegmatites occur in different flavors. One flavor is lithium pegmatites. There's generally only one payable element, which is lithium. The other flavor of rare of uh, pegmatites are rare earth pegmatites. They have multiple rare earths in them. So every ton of rock that you mine, you don't have one payable um, mineral. You have several. We have uranium, neodymium, presidymium, dysprosium, terbium. And in our last press release, we've just announced another one, which isn't really a rare earth, but it's another strategic metal that occurs in the pegmatite. It's called hafnium. Do you know what hafnium is worth per kilogram? I do not. $5,135. And you know what it's used for? No. <laughs> Rocket nozzles and jet turbines. Which is and, a growth industry. Yeah. You might have noticed over the weekend that SpaceX just launched the largest rocket in history. And it has hafnium in the rocket nozzles, of which there were 33 in the main stage booster. So hafnium gives the rocket nozzles the ability to withstand the tremendous temperatures of the rocket launch in a similar way the, the hafnium is used in the uh, jet engine turbines to withstand the tremendous temperatures there. It's an incredibly strategic element and the price has gone way up. And in our sampling, we just found about $800 worth of hafnium in a surface rock sample in our pegmatites. So we have a whole swarm of pegmatite veins on our property. Our property is 30 kilometers long, it has over 50 rare earth and uranium occurrences on it. And we're exploring it at the grassroots stage. And so what the, I'm, 
Yes. Does, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, does this mean that you basically every drill program that you run on this property, your targets aren't just one thing. Your your targets can be two or three things with the with the one drill. That's right. So add them all together. Basically, these rare earths occur. The monazite mineral that I mentioned, I said that the the major mineral for uh, rare earths in the world is monazite. So two things you want to know about monazite. Consider it like a car. The rare earths are passengers in the car. You don't have one passenger. It's not just one element. It's a group of elements. The light rare earths and the heavy rare earths all together occur as passengers in the monazite mineral. 25% of the monazite mineral that we get has the heavy rare earths, which are the more valuable ones, the magnet metals that we need for the electric motors and the dysprosium that we need for the heat resistant regenerative brakes. So this is valuable stuff. Uh, around 1% total rare earths is worth approximately $300 a ton. And we have 1% rare earth showings all over our property. We have some of our total rare earths go up to 30%, which is thousands of dollars per ton. And there's not a single drill hole in it. And we have a two cent stock. <laughs> so we would welcome some investment in this opportunity. It's good for the country. It's good for the environment. And I think we can make a lot of money on this property. Absolutely. If there are people out there that have the means to move a project like this forward, like what is it that Searchlight, beyond just people buying the stock, what does Searchlight really need to get the rubber to hit the road on this project? I think that uh, you would agree that the, the key thing is bringing the truth machine and, and drilling the drill hole. It's one thing to say, well, we've got surface samples uh, that run good grades, which we do. Uh, but the market knows there are ways of, of sampling things which kind of skew the results, but it's hard to skew a drill result because it's a, yeah. a cylinder that, that penetrates through the rock and gives you a uniform size of sample. Whereas when people take rock samples at surface, uh, they tend to pick the stuff that looks best. Right. So we need the, the truth seeker on this property, which means we need about a million and a half dollars to fund a significant drill program. Which and, you don't want to do two cents, obviously. No. So what we need is a strategic partner. And the good thing is uh, I've been uh, around the market with the Searchlight story for a couple of years. And even though the uh, investing public hasn't really uh, caught on to the incredible value in rare earths or even knows what a good assay is, um, strategic partners do know that. Right. And there is interest from governments and strategic sources because we don't want to be reliant on China for our supply of this kind of mineral. And there's even an article from Reuters magazine over the weekend saying that rare earths produced in the Western world may attract a significant premium from the purchasers just for the fact that it's coming from someplace other than China. That's well, a, we, a, that's if, a if report. Like, a hadmium, like, you know, using it for the nose cones of rockets, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the nose cones are abandoned on a rocket launch, right? They 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 fling them off to the side. The rocket comes back, but the hadmium doesn't. That's correct. So so basically, even the uh, as you know, Elon Musk is is a tremendous innovator in uh, rocket technology, and he's got um, boosters which can come back to uh, uh, come back to surface and be recycled. Correct? You, you've seen these. SpaceX yep. boosters landing on barges and then they're trucked back to the launch site and used again. The top half of the SpaceX rocket goes into orbit and the hafnium in those rocket nozzles is not recovered. Right. So the, the key test that they did on the weekend with SpaceX is they launched the largest rocket in history and both the uh, first stage booster and the second stage, the Starship, are both able to come back to Earth. Unfortunately for them, they both blew up. <laughs> so anyway other than spacex everybody else uses hafnium and it's not recycled so it's right. it's uh if you look at the the graph the price of hafnium as as doubled i became interested in it because i saw a youtube video from a a space rocket expert saying that spacex is actually cutting the size of the rocket nozzles because the hafnium and niobium are too expensive right. by the way Niobium occurs in the same pegmatites as rare earths and hafnium. So the message I have for our audience, Chris, is lithium pegmatites are great. People have made 
huge amounts of money finding lithium in pegmatites. The rare earth opportunity is even greater because the value of the commodities is higher. And as you suggested, there are multiple payable elements in these pegmatites. It's just a different flavor of ice cream. Lithium pegmatites are vanilla. Lithium's worth $20 a kilogram. Rare earths are worth anywhere from, you know, a hundred to uh, over a thousand dollars per kilogram. Right. This is, I'm looking at your market cap, which is a couple of million bucks. Yes. For for all of this, that seems bananas. It's all uh, uh, because we have not generated enough news, and the and the press releases that we put out have are not understood. So if I may, I'm just going to share the screen again. Sure. And uh, move over to this other map. Okay, so this is a table of elements from our uh, our last press release, and. We're talking about the, the market value of the elements in our uh, samples. $74 for uranium, $500 for dysprosium, $117 for neodymium and presidymium. They're like twin elements. They occur together and have the same use. And $1,896 for terbium and $5,135 for hafnium, as we've just discussed. And this is a sample of our... Um, sample values and we have 155 parts per million hafnium that is 0.15 of a kilogram and a kilogram is worth five thousand and uh five thousand one hundred and thirty five dollars so that's about eight hundred dollars worth of hafnium it has 600 parts per million uranium that's another hundred dollars in market value so this surface sample from uh our yellow brick road area is worth around $900 per ton. Just a piece of rock that our prospecting geologists have knocked off. And we've got significant high grade rare earths in our other samples at an area called Hot Ridge. Um, unfortunately, the press release was put out and we, we gave the market our assay values in parts per million. And then we gave the uh, market value of the commodities in kilograms per ton. So how do you get from one to the other? It's very right. simple. You take these numbers that are shown in parts per million. Just let's focus in on the hafnium as an example. This hafnium sample is 155 parts per million. To get to kilograms per ton, a, a ton is 1,000 kilograms. So one kilogram is one one thousandth. So to convert from parts per million to parts per thousand, you divide by a thousand. So this 155 parts per million is 0.155 kilograms per ton, 0.155 parts per thousand. Really? And you can do the same thing for uranium. And I've done the math. And this is what the market doesn't often do because it's it's not explained. And there are regulations about sure. uh, misleading investors. So this is where we come into it. And we can say to people, look, this is good value rock in comparison to other mining properties that we see. And as an example, a 1% lithium value in a drill hole would probably attract significant attention. That's about $200 a ton. This sample is about $900 a ton. So I thought it should have gotten some reaction in the market, but I don't believe it was understood. In fact, even the Stockwatch press release, looking at these samples that I'm displaying, they focused in on the 9,303 total rare earth value and didn't highlight this uh, value of 155 parts per million hafnium because people don't know what hafnium is. No. <laughs> they don't know the half of it. The people don't know what rare earth is. Like people it's, don't uh, know what rare earth is, but they should because it's it's your cell phone wouldn't work without rare earths yeah. and the electric motors wouldn't move without rare earths. It's, it's an incredibly valuable and increasingly valuable uh, commodity because of technology. These are really technology metals. Let me let me play devil's advocate here for a little bit. Um, rare earths cycles have come and gone in the past. There have been moments where the, the market paid attention and it didn't really come to where it needed to be. The, same with graphite. Um, same with lithium, to be honest. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit of a buzz stock uh, on and off, depending on what month it is. Um, but if we'd removed all of the rest and just looked at uranium, 
you've got essentially a, a, a ticket in six different lotteries, as I see it, without having to travel from one property to the next. You stick a drill in the ground at any point, any one of these things can come up uh, riches. Yes. By the way, uh, our Kulik Lake property, we are surrounded by uranium explorers because we are working in the Athabasca Basin. That's We were here looking for rare earths and uranium together. Everybody else is looking for a slightly different style of uh, deposit, and they're using different technologies. But we are literally surrounded by uranium explorers. So uh, what sort of uranium have you got sitting on your property? Uh, about 1%. Uranium at surface, <laughs> very good values. Which, by itself, like if all you were doing was playing the market and and me doing it, uh, that's a a nice little potential right there. Yes, and in addition to that, we have another property called Dudridge Lake where we have a modest open ended uranium resource uh, that has been drilled by Naranda and by Fission Energy. And Fission was all set to drill the Dudridge Lake property to make it bigger. And they found Patterson Lake South. So they just let it go. And Got we it. picked it up. We're doing exploration there as well. So we have major uh, results. We've had, had very little news over the summer, but we have done a uh, significant programs since we last talked. We've done uh, an airborne survey at uh, Kulik Lake. We've done an airborne survey at Dudridge Lake looking for radioactive elements. And this is the cool thing about working, looking for rare earths and uranium together. Uh, both of them are radioactive. So they advertise their presence and you can find them with these radiation surveys. And our initial survey at Kulik Lake was this green area on uh, this map. We did it and we found a six kilometer long thorium anomaly and a number of, of uranium anomalies. Just in the last month, we've done these two red areas called Daly Lake. And we have yet to publish the, the numbers from that. I haven't even seen them myself. But this is something that we have to look forward to. And then we've done another 800 kilometers of survey at, at uh, Dudridge Lake. Now, Dudridge Lake is fantastic because it has a big boulder field of high-grade uranium, up to 2% uranium at surface, with other critical metals included just as uh, bonuses. It also has cobalt, copper, and vanadium. So... That's Al, you've, you've you've got the bingo at this point. Yeah, we're bringing, we're bringing copper and vanadium into play. Like, is there a metal that you don't have access to? Copper, cobalt, and vanadium. You know, everybody says, yeah. "Oh no, cobalt's terrible. You can only get it from uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo." And there's child labor. We've got cobalt along with our uranium and copper and vanadium. Vanadium is another energy metal that is used in storage batteries. There's a a form of a stationary storage battery called a vanadium flow battery. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it can work well in conjunction with wind farms and solar solar farms to store the intermittent energy and deliver it when the period when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining. So it, it can be a, a very, very useful storage battery. So vanadium is interesting. Cobalt is critical for the uh, a key ingredient to keep uh, uh, electric vehicle batteries from overheating. That's what it does especially the nickel ones. And uh, copper, of course, is used increasingly in electric vehicles compared to an internal combustion engine vehicle. So yes, Dudridge Lake is good. It's road accessible. And the property has a big boulder field. It has a modest resource under it. The rest of the property is, is covered with a fairly heavy glacial till. And we've, we're looking for ways to see through that till to find more uranium and uh, these other elements. So we've done what's called a mobile metal ion survey, which we believe will pinpoint the better areas to drill on the property. So if I'm a, a casual retail investor, which I like, which I am, uh, I'm looking at a company like yours. And the first thing I'm thinking is, well, it's good that they have all that stuff, but there's so little, nothing's going to actually happen on the ground. But what you're telling me is, is that the stuff that's happening on the ground right now is extensive, inexpensive, and gives you a really good uh, idea of where you need to apply your resources going forward. Absolutely. That's the thing. We, we can go from zero to hero in a hurry because we're using very inexpensive um, exploration techniques. This uh, airborne radiometric survey we're doing, it would be interesting for you to interview the guy that does these surveys. He's uh, 
he's quite a bold explorer. He flies a kind of a crop duster survey in a Cessna at a very low level, just over the treetops with extremely sensitive radiation detectors. And he can, can fingerprint the uranium and the thorium, which is coming from monazite. And he can right. tell us, well, you've got a, a uranium show, showing over here and you've got a thorium showing over here. And it was his survey, survey that led to the discovery of Patterson Lake South. And we're applying his technology both on Kulik Lake and on Dudridge Lake. And so we're finding lots of stuff. And it's exciting. I must, I must tell you, even though the market doesn't realize what we're doing, as a person that's been in the exploration business for a long time, I know how close we are to major success. You know, one of the things I've always noticed in mining is, is the first people that know the value of a project are the neighbors of the project. Uh, I would think that with the amount of companies around you, that they'd be knocking on your door saying, you know, here's an offer or here are some partnerships, some JVs. Are they just too focused on uranium to really bother with what you're looking at? Well, I have to say that we are pioneering looking for rare earths and uranium together. There's only one other company in the market that's doing that in Saskatchewan, and it's called Appia Rare Earths and Uranium. And by the way, their stock trades at a multiple of our value. Right. Yeah. But uh, most of the other explorers are focused on one model of uranium. And, you know, moving forward in science, we, we move through a series of paradigms. In exploration, if somebody discovers a high-grade new discovery, they develop a model. And then everybody else tries to apply that model elsewhere. Well, we're doing a little bit of a different model. We're looking at the same kind of hard rock deposits as the lithium deposits in Canada and Australia, but we're looking at another flavor and there's virtually nobody doing this. So we're a bit of a pioneer. Our neighbors around the basin are looking at a different style of deposit. They're doing different kinds of exploration, but we're just picking up the low hanging fruit of rare earths and uranium at surface, which I submit makes a lot more sense given the kind of values that we're getting. And your stock is two cents, which means you know a small player, relatively speaking, can gobble up a significant amount. Yes. That's and right. if it goes to three cents, then you've just made fifty percent of your money. It's it's a it's a pretty good little arbitrage opportunity, I think. That's right. And and the question is, well, you know, people might be concerned because of our low price. Well, you know, you just might go out of business. Well, we've been around for twenty three years. <laughs> <laughs> we we have a very low burn rate. We have no debt, and our properties were acquired directly from the government by staking. So that means we aren't paying third parties exorbitant funds. It's it's a it's a very very um, durable financial structure. Indeed, and I imagine you're not looking to do any raises at two cents. But uh, you know, if you did get a little bit of uh, attraction in the in the the share price, at what point do you think okay now's the time that we can start raising? Well, basically, we are telling our story to the market, and when we find uh, a, a lead order, somebody that's 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 buying our stock and likes our story, well, we'll offer them a piece of a financing. We will need to finance or do deals with our property portfolio. We have more than twelve properties in Saskatchewan. We've only talked about two here. We have more than a dozen. Jeez, we have we have four past producing gold mines on our property. We have outstanding prospects for copper, nickel, and and other elements as well, and. Uh, what we've been doing is trying to build up the value in our land ownership. And it is a vast portfolio. I don't know of any other company that has this much stuff trading at our price. Are you working on those properties or are they, they basically for later? We're working on four different properties right now. And we've, we've, we've spent a fair amount of time working on gold. But a couple of years ago, we we decided to turn our focus to uh, critical metals. So our gold properties have been worked on. We've drilled a bunch of holes uh, and they're in good standing until 2038 to 2040. And we'll work on them if we see the gold break through to new highs. So we're, we're trying to remain uh, involved in the elements that are needed and that are, are giving us good prices. So uh, the concern for a casual investor might be that, you know, if if the market shifts, will your attention shift in a way that, you know, it, it doesn't allow one project to really move forward to where it needs to be. Yeah. That's, the, a, that's the, a valid concern. So then you have to say, just like uh, the, 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 the saying in hockey is 
you don't go to where the puck is now. You go to where the puck is going to be. I think Wayne Gretzky is credited with that saying. Yes. Where, where is the puck going to be in the next three to five years? We think it's going to be in strategic metals, rare earths, uranium, hafnium, elements that are needed for a green revolution. We're basically predicting that this is where the action will be. And if we have some kind of political crisis, which causes the gold prices to go up, we have gold properties that we can activate. And we haven't talked about it, but one of our key strategies is to locate our properties close to infrastructure. This Kulik Lake property is close to a, a, an operating uranium mine and mill, which could conceptually process the radioactive ores that would come from Kulik Lake. Our gold properties are located close to Flin Flon. There's underground development on it. There is a major mine and mill complex in Flin Flon that's five kilometers from our property and the mill is not being used. There's a 5,000 ton a day mill. There's a massive tailing spawn. There's all the infrastructure you would need to process yes. gold there. So we've located our properties well uh, relative to mining infrastructure, which means we don't need to put a lot of capital investment to get this thing to cash flow. So you're, you're low risk because you're not burning through money. You don't have any debt. You've got a bunch of properties that you can kick off if the market really revs in a certain direction. You've got experienced guys that have done it before. Um, you've got multi ores in one place. It, yes. it seems to me like this, this is a good opportunity. People will look at the two cents stock and, and being relatively illiquid and say, well, you know, if I need to get out, how do I get out? I would look at it and say at two cents, you could be buying this thing for the next few years and you're you're going to get it cheap. It's almost like a, it's an RSP at yes. this point. And you've got so many metals. It's just, it's basically you're, you're pulling electric vehicles out of the ground unassembled. Yeah. I think that the, the recent share price is, is a new low for the company and it's because of uh, the sell-off in the speculative markets, tax loss season. Yep. And a lack of news. As we get into early next year, I think a cyclical rebound could give a hundred percent return on the stock. We've been seeing in a lot of companies that we talk to, a lot of potential clients and clients. There's, there's a lot of talk about January, February being where the resource market really starts applying itself. So yes. I, I think this presents people with an opportunity over the next month or so to accrue the stock really cheaply, while nobody knows about it. Before you guys get to find that that magic, I imagine someone's going to come along and offer you a JV or or straight up cash to go digging into that thing because honestly, like it doesn't matter what the market's doing when you're at two cents and you're you're dealing with all the things you're dealing with. Right. So we think there will be strategic interest, particularly in our critical metals properties. And with the government of Saskatchewan doing the, the final thing for you, which is creating the mill that you need to to make everything work and bring a premium. Yes. Damn, Alf, it's a uh, it's a good story. I've, I've I've seen a lot of people get very excited over a lot less just down the street from where you're at. <laughs> if uh, you know. I, I guess there's going to be people who are going to say you know, the the thing you normally do when you've got all of these opportunities is either spin some out or sell some to finance your drilling. Is, is there any talk of that or are you really sort of focused on, no, we're going to keep all of our, our chips on the table? Well, we, we basically would like to uh, have some partners on some of our properties. It's it's clearly too much for, for what we can do ourselves. Right. So uh, those interested parties should give you a call. Absolutely. Well, like normally we uh, we do these to appeal to the retail investor who's looking for a casual thing to to jump into or their portfolio. But this, uh, I think, really is strategically. Uh, this is this is you know minor league scouting uh, opportunity for a, a big player to you know s throw off. A million or so into mining it, into drilling a project that could potentially be something that's outstanding. Um, you know, I think the reason you're at two cents, obviously, is nobody knows the story. But do you think that's going to change over the next three, four months? Do you think you're going to get enough news flow that people start paying attention? I do. I think uh, by PDAC this year, it'll be a 
a, a much better picture in terms of the market reception. Got it. And the key thing I would point out, Chris, is we've talked about rare earths. And if you take, uh, you know, the, the 10,000 foot overview of the speculative market, the sectors that are hot are the ones that the commodities are hot. The commodities that have been hot, lithium and uranium. Yeah. But China is moving to restrict strategic metals. They've already restricted gallium, germanium, and graphite. And they've just announced that they, they are requiring rare earth exporters to register with the government and, and disclose who their clients are externally. And I think rare earth is a much more important strategic card for China than people realize. The United States is restricting high-tech computer chips to China. I believe China is going to retaliate by restricting rare earth supplies to the West. That would be catastrophic at this point. But it would be extremely beneficial for speculative investors in one of the highest grade rare earths and the best located jurisdiction for processing them, which is where we are. <laughs> And this no. is what happened in 2010 and 2011 when China restricted the rare earth supply. The prices went up 500. percent Sure. So we are basically positioned to benefit from those uh, those trade restrictions from China. And by the way, yeah. you know, China got into the rare earth business because they saw the future. And just like Canada is blessed with certain natural resources, like the the Canadian oil sands is a is a vast resource, as you're aware. China knew. 30 years ago that it had a vast resource of rare earths. So they've developed that industry with government support and they put everybody else out of business. But the reason I'm mentioning that is China is now a net importer of rare earth ores. They're right. not an exporter. They no longer have a supply that's abundant. They're a net importer. So if they need it themselves, they can easily cut off the rest of the world. Well, uh, you know, uh, normally when I talk to chairman of companies that are stocks at two cents, I see a, a little desperation behind their eyes. I don't see that with you, man. You're smiling. You yeah, know, it, it's like I, you know what you're sitting on. Come on, I'm saying to investors, come on in. The water's fine. It's fun. What we're doing is truly exciting. And I've been in the exploration game for 40 years. I've worked all over Western and Northern Canada, and I've funded uh, mining exploration companies as an investment banker. And I'm excited about this just because the prospectivity is so high and the amount of work that's been done is so low. Man, well, I, I think this is the beginning of a very uh, important story. And we'll certainly keep talking to you about where you're at because uh, I know I've bought in at, at, uh, at the current share price because why wouldn't you? It's, it's like couch change at this point. But I can see exactly where you're going to go. And all it takes is, is one person of means to stumble us backwards into the story and this thing's gonna uh, i think propel yes alf it's always a pleasure you're one of the good guys and uh we're happy to represent you here because uh there's a a lot of people searching for ore up in uh in uranium in saskatchewan there um and they're all looking for the same thing and ignoring the stuff that is sitting around them in abundance that you're looking at right now I think uh, you are indeed where the puck is going. This is Alf Stewart from Searchlight Resources. SCLT is the ticker symbol. And uh, let's talk again soon, man. Thanks, Chris.